So we don't want to forget as we go through all this fabulous spiritual stuff that in our story of me getting inflammatory breast cancer, there I was with the diagnosis and I decided to start fasting. Fasting and cancer seems to have some really good scientific proof behind it right now because, and, and this kind of relates to life too, we think of cancer as this just insanely powerful being that takes over us, starts growing in your body and nothing's going to get it to stop. But really, when you actually sit and look at cancer cells themselves, they're very weak and they're very fragile. They don't handle stress, believe it or not. So they are incapable of surviving through the stress that fasting causes. Because what happens in fasting is that your body shuts down really a lot of its functions to help you get through the fast, right? And cancer cells are out of control, but they're not robust. And so the body stops feeding the cancer cells as kind of one of the first things of the starvation process. So me in my wisdom <laughs> decided that if I was going to fast, that I was going to do it really, really well. So two things was happening when a whole bunch of my family came, you know, to be with me and support me and they were feeling kind of guilty about like, well, can we eat? You know, even though I'm sitting there not eating, they were feeling bad about eating, kind of, kind of the same way you feel about taking a drink when you're around somebody who's trying to, you know, who, an alcoholic who has quit drinking. And I'm like, yeah, 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 keep, keep eating, you know, it shouldn't bother me. And as a matter of fact, I was thinking about um, what I had read about how fasting puts stress on the cancer cells. And I decided I wanted to make sure that this was done to the fullest possible extent. So first of all, I was on just a water fast because doing any sort of juice or anything like that would put sugar into my body. So we had to just go 100% water. But I decided we might as well add a mental element to it as well. And so I told my family that I need to not only fast, but I need to convince my body that it's starving and that it's a terrible, horrible crisis. So we all started doing, oh, they went along with me, my poor family. <laughs> and so they, they went along with me starting to beg for food because I figured unless I was really begging for food, I mean, if I was like fasting in like a really meditative joyous state, you know, is that going to really let my body know that I'm starving to death? So I decided I, I needed to beg for food and everyone told me, no, you can't have any. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started, every time they ate, I started begging for food and they're like, no, you can't have any. And it was really funny. My poor little grandson was like, you know, a year and a half, something like that. He didn't understand the joke and he didn't understand what was going on. And so I'm like begging for food. And I just remember the poor little guy. He finally comes up to me with this cookie and he's like, here, you can have my cookie. <laughs> Which is big for a little kid right there. The ones who are always begging for stuff. And here he was, you can have my cookie. <laughs> But the funniest thing of all was me and my husband went to grocery store. And so we're walking around the grocery store. We had to buy something. And right as you come up to the checkout was a cooler that had, um, you know, frozen ice cream bars in it. 
So I started begging Wayne for the ice cream bars. Please let me have an ice cream bar, please. And he's like, no, you can't have an ice cream bar. And I'm like, oh, please, I want one so bad. I'm so hungry. And he, he looks at me and says, you can't have one. I fed you last week. <laughs> you should have seen the looks on the faces of everybody else standing there in line. So I'm not sure that probably didn't really add to the effect of really feeling like I was starving myself to death because it was just <laughs> too funny and we had too much good time laughing about it. And we're really lucky that they didn't call the child abuse, you know, cops. <laughs> So in, in our in our last uh, video, we were talking about the Sufi heart with independence and indifference. And we were also talking about Native societies. And one of the things that I've, I've read with my Native wisdom keepers is that they say that, you know, the elders and, and the more awake people in the tribes were always, of course, you know, working with everybody else and that they just had a beautiful, light-hearted, laughing relationship with life itself. So spirituality doesn't have to be serious and dramatic in any way. As a matter of fact, it's probably better if it isn't. Because just think about what we're trying to get. You're trying to get rid of the ego, of the naps, right? Of this thing that kind of has, feels like it has captured your consciousness. It feels like a cancer, kind of like something outside of you that has taken over your heart, taken over your mind, and you don't know who you are underneath it. So we need to starve it just exactly the same way as I was trying to starve the cancer. And just simply sitting still and trying to not let it move you is not going to be as beneficial as fooling it. And I think one of the easiest ways to fool it is with lightheartedness and laughter.